All right, how's it going everybody? So today we're gonna to talk about what is wildlife ecology and management? Essentially, what is this class about? Uh, we're gonna talk about the history of wildlife management and uh, talk about how, how wildlife is defined and why that's important and talk about some of the things relative to this field. So what are wildlife? That probably seems like a pretty easy question for you to answer, but it actually uh, can get fairly convoluted and that matters a lot to distinguish what is wildlife and what isn't, especially when we start talking about regulating those resources and conserving those resources. So depending on your viewpoint, you might think of wildlife as something different and uh, when I ask students this question, I often ask <clears throat> during the, the discussions for this class, what are wildlife? If you haven't seen this presentation yet, do you normally would, would uh, think of wildlife very differently between individuals, even within our major, which is pretty amazing. We, we don't even within our major often think of the same things as wildlife. So uh, the viewpoint has been changing over time Essentially, when we uh, first started thinking about wildlife, that was pretty much designated to free-ranging animals, particularly birds and mammals that were hunted. Okay, so we thought of wildlife as, as birds or mammals that we were hunting like northern bobwhite or wild turkey, uh, white-tailed deer, elk, you know, those species were considered wildlife and, and the rest of the species were not, which is pretty amazing to think about. It wasn't that long ago, we're going to go into the timeline a little bit, but it wasn't that long ago before we didn't think of other species as being wildlife even. That's, that's just interesting for me to think about. So uh, that transitioned uh, more recently into terrestrial vertebrates being wildlife. And even for the Wildlife Society, it hasn't been that long before that still was the, the ter you know, terrestrial vertebrates was still basically the definition of what the Wildlife Society were calling wildlife. And there have actually been a few commentaries in the Journal of Wildlife Management, so the, the uh, our discipline's major journal. There have been a couple of commentaries from scientists kind of making the point that maybe we should be thinking about wildlife more broadly and why are we not publishing on invertebrates and, and uh, you know, species that wouldn't fall within this terrestrial vertebrates. And those have been even within the last 10 years. The, the journal itself has been biased away from things that are not terrestrial vertebrates. So, uh, you know, th this is uh, constantly changing and pretty important. Uh, more recently in the last decade or two, we start thinking about all wild animals and plants. And this really uh, caught on when we started thinking about managing ecosystems and trying to conserve the way that they function, which includes obviously plants and animals in those systems. When you think about it from the perspective of Congress, now think about this, what, what Congress calls wildlife has to be extremely broad, but also specific at the same time so that it can hold up in court, right? So this makes a huge difference. And this week in our discussion, uh, we're going to talk about uh, an, an issue related to this to try to to highlight why this distinction is so important, but Congress views wildlife as anything in the animal kingdom, and that includes mammals, fishes, birds. Most of you probably before you saw this, uh, at least in my experience, when we're working with students, most people don't think of fish as being wildlife, but they are included in Congress's definition. Amphibians, reptiles, where it really, we get the disconnect, especially in society, is thinking about things like mollusks, crustaceans, arthropods, so the bugs that are crawling around the house, you know, other invertebrates, people don't think of, of those things as wildlife in general, but they certainly count in terms of uh, the definition from the U.S. Congress, but also uh, the Congress also stipulates that any part, product, egg, an eggshell, hair, feathers, 
the offspring, any sort of part of their body, you get the idea, any of that, that all from a regulatory standpoint, from the perspective of the U.S. Congress counts as wildlife. Now, why do you think they would do that? Why would we count eggshells or feathers? So the short answer to that is think about endangered species. Uh, for instance, some of you may have been down to the Florida Keys, and uh, if you've been in the Key Deer Refuge, you'll know that uh, that's a subspecies of deer that's on the endangered species list. It is not allowed to pick up an antler and take it with you. So we pick up, or at least uh, people in this field, including me, commonly pick up antlers if you find them in the woods and use them. I, I have them decorating my office right now from antlers I found out in the woods somewhere. That is illegal when it's that endangered species, and it's because the, the antler is considered wildlife, and because that species falls under the Endangered Species Act, now that regulation uh, stipulates that I cannot have in my possession that antler. So the same thing goes uh, with a lot of bird species, even uh, birds that are not endangered might be might fall under the endangered or uh, that don't fall under the Endangered Species Act might fall under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, for instance. So there are lots of different protections where I'm going to give you some resources to go some, through some of this uh, legislation for some really key events in our history and also key people that have uh, played a role along the way. So you can look at some of those things, but uh, hopefully you get the understanding now of why that definition is so important. So as I was saying, historically only game species were included as wildlife. In the 60s, that's when it really expanded to start including other non-game species, especially the amphibians and reptiles. The invertebrates, honestly, it, it took decades before that really caught on as wildlife, even within our field, like I was talking about with the, some of our journals in our field. Uh, and then the more modern management approach where we're trying to manage for ecosystem processes rather than any given species in particular, uh, we started considering uh, some of the more rare and endangered species as a top priority with the idea that those those serve as a sentinel for how the system is functioning. So if you try to measure, think about that for a minute, how complex that could be, what does it even mean to measure an ecosystem service or uh, how well an ecosystem is functioning? It just, that, that's so complex and has so many different meanings, it's almost not definable. One of the ways as uh, professionals in our field that we've come up with to, to, uh, indicate or like an indicator of how well it's functioning is how well it serves as habitat for some of these endangered species. So we might have a focal species like the red cockaded woodpecker, for instance, in Longley Pine ecosystem. Uh, it's a pretty uh, a, a pretty commonly used sentinel species for us to understand how well that's functioning. Gopher tortoise would be another pretty good example of that. So uh, more in the last couple of decades, those species have become a real top priority. We're trying to, you know, the Endangered Species Act in particular has uh, uh, necessitated that we focus on those species on public lands and they, for that reason, have become top priority. And in many cases, they're, they're used as an indicator of how well a system is functioning. So what is, if you, most of you have probably taken an ecology course or, or talked about what ecology is, it's essentially animals interacting with their environment. Wildlife ecology would be specifically the discipline of applying those ecological principles to studying wildlife. And again, wildlife would include all the things uh, when I'm saying wildlife, I'm talking about it from the perspective of Congress's definition. So I'm thinking about invertebrates and vertebrates alike and plants and marine, terrestrial, all of those. So <clears throat> when we talk about wildlife management, now we're talking about uh, the managing of those wildlife by applying those ecological pr principles. <clears throat> this is from our the Wildlife Society. They classify wildlife management as being uh, 
this triangle in the middle that links into these other three important pillars. So we know we have to have animals to have wildlife. We know they have to have habitat to live. And probably one of the most importantly now, well, maybe not most important. I guess it's got to be most important that you have an animal first, right? But they need habitat to live, so that's pretty important. But something that, that a lot of you that have gotten into this field or you may not think about wildlife management being uh, the management of people, but the human dimensions of wildlife is absolutely essential. And that's why uh, this figure is showing that as one of the essential elements. You don't get anything done if you don't have human involvement in it, right? We have uh, policies and cultures and all sorts of, of things going on with people. There, you know, people are stakeholders. They influence all of the decisions, and it's really important to effectively uh, make policies and communicate and extend knowledge and educate. All of those things are essential for wildlife management to be successful, and they're only becoming more essential over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, when we're thinking about ma wildlife management, we're thinking about managing populations. And we're thinking about that from the context of the ecosystem again. So we have the Lone Life Pine ecosystem and wildlife management in that system may be to manage uh, gopher tortoise populations. So let me give you some things to think about. One, stewardship. So we're basically talking about looking after populations. We're not really going out of our way to actively do things for the population, but we're also not trying to do things damaging, right? So we may not, uh, let's think about it from a pollution standpoint, we may not be actively going out and trying to clean up rivers, but we certainly aren't going and pouring chemicals into them either, right? That'd be a stewardship type of activity. You're not you're not trying to damage the resource, but you're also not really going out of your way to actively help it. So stewardship uh, historically was very common even in the U.S. And, you know, well, I guess we started with where we didn't even have stewardship. We just thought re wildlife resources were inexhaustible resources and therefore we could just do what we wanted. Then uh, we started realizing that, that that was a problematic view and started thinking about it from a stewardship standpoint. You know, uh, we're not actively trying to restore populations or manage populations, but we're not trying to get rid of them either. <clears throat> so uh, the problem is when that fails, that's when we get into uh, either a protective strategy or a restorative pre uh, strategy. So you can think about those, uh, excuse me, you can think about those uh, for a few minutes. We're going to come back to this issue. So basically, now we have an active or a more engaged uh, sense of, of uh, responsibility to conserve species. So like in the Lonely Pine ecosystem, for instance, the gopher tortoise is a species of conservation concern, and we might be taking protective and restorative measures in that case. So. Uh, from the standpoint of goals of wildlife management for the gopher tortoise, we were trying to increase populations. For another species, the let's say uh, northern bob, well, that's not a good example, wild turkey. So for wild turkey, we, the population of wild turkey in Florida is doing pretty good. Not, in, not so in all, all cases. Some states are not doing as well. Uh, they are in decline across the southeast in several states. But for the most part in Florida, we're managing those populations for a harvest, right? So how many animals can you harvest at a sustainable level so that you don't over harvest the population and cause it to decline? We don't want it to necessarily increase or decline. We're just trying to, to, uh, to keep it relatively stable. With the, in the case of wild pigs, for instance, that's an invasive species. They've been here for hundreds of years, but they're pretty destructive. And they cause lots of problems. Uh, that would be a species that we might manage the population by trying to decrease the population. 
So <clears throat> when we're thinking about uh, these wildlife management strategies, they generally fall into two types. So you'd have one that's more of a manipulative where we're actively trying to do things to conserve it, uh, the resource, and that could be direct or indirect. So direct would be like, uh, you know, we have white-tailed deer, we're trying to keep them at a relatively low population level that is sustainable. So we might have that sustainable harvest, but uh, we also know that if we stop harvesting them, they can very quickly become overabundant and have damaging effects on the system. That'd be a direct manipulation of that population by manipulating harvest regulations for for people right so people are actually going out and removing animals taking it home to eat or whatever uh, but that's directly manipulating that population another way that we might do that is just you know one thing i engage in a lot is prescribed fire right i'm using fire to manage resources so I'm managing plant communities for habitat for the uh the prey species and this or the excuse me, the white-tailed deer. So I might use fire to improve habitat quality for deer. So we may not necessarily want more deer, but we might want better habitat so that we can better sustain those same number of deer. Another indirect would be that we have a prey species. That's why I slipped up a minute ago because I saw that I had a predator thing on here. Uh, so a prey species, you know, uh, we may not necessarily directly manage that. One that's really common for this would be northern bobwhite. We don't necessarily directly manage populations of bobwhite through manipulating bag limits, but it is very common to try to reduce the density of their predators to increase their population size. Also uh, really common to manage their habitat. So these types of approaches, these manipulative ones, are, are generally uh, used by uh, some federal agencies and, and state agencies, but we have another approach, which is more of the preservation model. So this would be the conservation model, the manipulative. The custodial model would be more of a pr preservation standpoint and you see I have the National Park Service on here that actually is their model so the idea is to just protect or prevent uh, use of a particular area so you have a national park that's actually based on the the uh, directive of the National Park Service their objectives are to preserve that that process this can get kind of tricky to think about so for instance, uh, we've extirpated predators of deer. They, they've been gone from the Eastern United States for like a hundred years, right? So if we have a national park in the Eastern United States, it's pretty likely that deer populations are going to be a problem if you're not actively managing it. But the park service is mandated to take a preservation strategy. So uh, these, you know, these regulations like this can be really important for how we might deal with that situation. Another problem with the preservation model is look at global change. You know, we're trying to preserve a state that may not function very well in this new context with global uh, global change. So that's another potential issue. Uh, another issue might be, uh, you know, plant communities, for instance, are succeeding all the time. If you don't aren't actively managing with fire in the southeast, the plant community often will succeed to a alternative stable state. So like longleaf pine ecosystem, if that's not burned frequently, it transitions to an upland hardwood forest system over time. Now that might take 150 years, but we're, you know, we're trying to preserve something that's all, always changing is my point. And uh, that, that makes it tricky with the, the preservation strategy, but, there are major benefits in some context to having that that land just set aside. So I don't want you to think that I'm uh, downplaying the role of of uh, the National Park Service or that model. It's just something that uh, that uh, comes with issues, just like the manipulative does. So <clears throat> another problem with both. Uh, <clears throat> both approaches is that often 
we want to assign, assign value to things. And when we're talking about, you know, uh, that that's not necessarily objective. So is it good to have 10 deer or 100 deer? Is it good to have a sustainable population of tortoises or, uh, you know, twice the carrying capacity? You know, we, we're basically assigning value to these things. And, you know, for us in this field, it's not really our job to assign value. We are we are uh, trying to meet objectives. There's not necessarily a right or wrong. You know, whether or not we should get rid of wild pigs on our public lands, that, that isn't, that, that's a value judgment, right? There are lots of people that disagree on that and are on both sides of that issue. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we're, the, these kind of objectives are often set by the government, but they're bringing in constituents. There was actually just recently a town hall meeting on an issue for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission where people were invited to give comments and feedback on a policy. So uh, that is actually dictating what the value is, not necessarily our own values. So that's something that's tricky. It's hard to, to step away from your own values. I mean, it's uh, virtually impossible for me to do that, you know, but I, I constantly as a scientist trying to stay objective, do that same thing. For instance, I have a graduate student right now, you'll hear from her later in the year, uh, she's studying wild pigs, and one of the things we were looking at is how wild pig invasions affect other wildlife species. And when we, in our studies, it shows that they're pretty strongly negative on that. I can't help but want to view wild pigs being in the system as being a strongly negative thing. But that's not good as a scientist for us to think that way, right? We're trying to be objective. And, and uh, for that research, we had to be open to the idea that we might do this study and find that pigs don't have a negative effect, or maybe they even have a positive effect, right? They're wallowing in the system. We'll talk about this more, but uh, that serves as a, a source of habitat potentially for some species. So, uh, you know, that maintaining that objectivity as a wildlife manager or, or wildlife scientist is really important for you to, to think about. The technical judgments, that is more where we have the advantage, right? You're getting trained, you're, you're in training right now to think about uh, the, the techniques and the, you have, you're, getting, you're learning the information and the facts to apply knowledge to particular situations to try to achieve some goal, right? So the goal is more of the value judgment that is normally set by the government and from feedback from the constituents, which is the general public, the technical judgments are normally left more to the wildlife managers to make that decision. So when we're talking about science in general, we generally have this initial phase where we have descriptive research. So like with this case of this, these turtles right here, how many eggs are they laying? How many survive when they, uh, they're trying to make it to the ocean? How many survive then to reproductive maturity? How many of those nest? You know, those kinds of things are descriptive. We're just learning about the biology and ecology of the species we're managing. Then we would transition into more of an experimental approach. So let's say with those uh, those same turtles, uh, one of the major predators of turtle hatchlings, or uh, let's say turtle eggs, are raccoons. So we might have an experimental approach where we could say, okay, this many hatchlings normally survive. What happens if we initiate a raccoon removal program so that there's not that predation? How does that affect how many survive? Uh, to hatching. So those would that'd be a manipulation in that experiment. And that's a really powerful thing to do. So we, we learn a lot about the system and how it's functioning. And then we start tinkering with things in a controlled manner to manipulate uh, specific isolated variables to see how they're actually influencing the way that the system works. So here's a, a quick uh, view of the scientific method. I don't want this lecture to last much longer, so I'm going to uh, just let this be here for you to take a look at. But it's pretty important for you to go through the scientific method. I have uh, kind of listed out the process that you would go through for that. Here's a hint. 
this is going to show up on your exam. There, we're going to have things about the scientific method, so please make sure you understand it and you understand the order in which we do things and why we might do them that way. So one thing that you might hear pretty commonly is people say, well, you know, that's applied research or basic research at a university. Uh, you might hear that commonly. Essentially, the difference is you know, we do basic research just for the sake of trying to know something, right? We don't necessarily have anything in mind that it's useful for to have this knowledge, but uh, it's pretty important just to gain knowledge for the sake of gaining knowledge. Now, you may think, well, I want to do something that's applied. Well, keep in mind that basic research has led us to innumerable discoveries. Google search this. Google search the discoveries that have, you know, for applied reasons from basic research. I'm not sure exactly what those search terms are, but I know I've done that in the past, and it comes up with some pretty awesome things. Some of the basic research that we learned things that all of a sudden we realized we needed for some applied purpose. The applied research is when you already have something identified. I already know that there are too few recalcated woodpecker on this management area, the applied research would might go in to try to address that concern. All right, finally, uh, I wanted you to uh, go and read about the Wildlife Society and think about what uh, their values are. That's a pretty important, especially for the WEC majors, for you to, to get engaged in your some of your local societies. We have a bunch here. Uh, the Wildlife Society is the one that's probably most related to this class, but we certainly have plenty of other organizations for you to be involved in that that are uh, that are relevant. But uh, they they have a, a unique take on what wildlife are and and uh, take stances on some of these policies and things. So it's really interesting read for you to take a look at. Also, uh, these are the journals that I mentioned earlier. The Journal of Wildlife Management is kind of the capstone. Uh, journal for the Wildlife Society, but if you're interested in looking at that, uh, you can find scientific information. I might actually, well, at least a couple of times I'm going to share manuscripts that were published in one of these outlets for the, for your readings in the class, but I uh, just wanted you to be aware that these things are here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and cut this one off here. Appreciate you listening. Please stay tuned for more content and material.